OK, uh, today's questions. We're finally uh, coming to the end of persuasion. Question one, why do you think Mrs Smith's key role in the Mr Elliot plot might say about the rigid class distinctions of that society? So in other words, we know that Mrs Smith is currently now in a lower class. She's poor and disabled, and yet she plays a key role in one of the most important plot lines of the novel, which is whether Anne uh, will end up with Captain Wentworth or Mr. Elliot. And we know that it's because Mrs. Smith, this lower class woman, gives Anne key information about Mr. Elliot, uh, about what kind of evil person he is, uh, that Anne chooses uh, Captain Wentworth, or at least she chooses not to accept Mr. Elliot's um, pursuit of her. So what might this fact say uh, about how the novel understands the rigid class distinctions of that society? Well, I think it says that uh, class distinctions should not be so rigid. Um, Throughout most of the novel, we are mainly concerned with the business and the affairs of upper class people. Uh, and we see that most of these upper class people are not very good people. We have Sir Walter and Elizabeth vain and proud. Uh, we can also include Lady Dalrymple and Miss Carteret in this category as well, vain and proud. Uh, we have Mary and her husband Charles, who, well, I guess just Mary, who uh, is perennially dissatisfied with what happens in her life. Uh, most of the people uh, are not able to effectively react when Louisa has her accident, All right? Even Captain Wentworth loses his head and, and starts blaming himself instead of at first taking care of the situation, sending Louisa to a hospital, that kind of thing. Uh, even the elder Musgroves, Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove, uh, uh, Charles's mother and father, are often disturbed and, and uh, are not able to make clear plans whenever they think of what happened to Louisa. So we see that in this novel, simply being upper class, or in the case of the uh, naval officers, upper middle class, does not guarantee that you are a good person. Uh, and at the same time, Mrs. Smith, uh, who is currently of a lower class, uh, ends up being one of the best people in the novel. Uh, so from this evidence, we can see that uh, the novel is not just telling us that class and virtue or character are not the same thing. It's also telling us that different classes live in the same society. There is no clear separation of uh, worlds between the different classes, and that's how Mrs Smith from a lower class is able to have such an important influence on Anne's decisions, even though Anne is from an upper class. And we also see how uh, the reason that Anne makes the correct decision is because she does not ignore Mrs. Smith simply because Mrs. Smith is from a lower class. And we know values character and virtue and morals and conversation. And all of these things Mrs. Smith has. So even though they are currently from two different classes, uh, Anne doesn't care. And so uh, Anne is able to get the uh, key information that she needs to make the right decision. And we already see a hint of this from last week's reading when, uh, remember we were talking about the idea of gossip or anecdotes, personal stories, and Anne agrees with Mrs. Smith 
that someone like Nurse Rook, who is from the working class, can have valuable information and knowledge of human nature because she is working class, because she has to go to different people's houses and take care of them. Uh, so the novel, I believe, argues against the rigid distinction of class. OK, that was fast. Question two. Why do you think judging a person based on their private correspondence is a violation of the laws of honor? Uh, so let's take a look at this. So here, um, Mrs. Smith is showing Anne a letter that she that Anne, uh, Mrs. Smith previously received from Mr. Elliot uh, to show what a terrible person Mr. Elliot actually is. Uh, and of course, Anne is shocked. This is actual proof, right? It's not just Mrs. Smith talking. But here, this is page 135. And was obliged to recollect that her seeing the letter was a violation of the laws of honor. That no one ought to be judged or to be known by such testimonies. That no private correspondence could bear the eye of others. Uh, before she could recover calmness enough to return the letter, which she had been meditating over and say thank you. So. On the one hand, this is clear evidence that Mr. Smith is a terrible uh, Mr. Elliot is a terrible person. On the other hand, uh, Anne very quickly reminds herself that she's not supposed to be reading other people's letters. It is a violation of the laws of honor, and the novel explains why. Uh, because no private correspondence could bear the eye of others. What does this mean? Well, thankfully, we previously have already seen the film uh, Love and Friendship. And if you remember in that movie, a, a very important part of the plot is when. Um, what's his name? Mr. Darcy? No, not Darcy. Uh, the guy can't remember his name reads a letter sent by Lady Susan to her friend Alicia. Or I guess Alicia uh, and. What the, the letter, of course, is also evidence that Lady Susan is a terrible person. Um, but. When Lady Susan learns that this has happened, her first reaction is to blame the dude for reading. Uh, private correspondence and later when when she confronts him, uh, she explains that because the letter was written for a particular person, uh, if someone else were to read the letter, it is very easy to take the words out of context to misunderstand her meaning. Now in the movie, of course, that's bullshit. It's just a terrible letter. Um, and here also. Mrs. Smith has given us ample context. She has entirely explained what a terrible person Mr. Elliot is. That is the correct context. Uh, so here reading this letter, uh, Anne gets exactly the impression that uh, is truthful to the kind of person Mr. Elliot is. But the general principle is that it is easy to misunderstand a letter. Um, on the one hand, as I just said, it's it's sent to a particular person. And so there are a lot of meanings and understandings between these two people that a third person may not know. Moreover, another reason why it is easy to misinterpret letters is because remember this is before email, before text messages, before Facebook, before line. So letters were often not just a single letter. They were ongoing conversations. Uh, some conversations through letters uh, evolved over a lifetime. 
So it's not just about two people. It's also about what these two people had said in previous letters. Uh, sometimes when you read old letters, you will see uh, references to previous letters. Like as I mentioned in the letter of like last week or whatever. Uh, so sometimes when you read someone else's letter, uh, maybe that letter is depending on what has previously been written and sent. And if you don't understand what was talked about before, it is also easy to misinterpret uh, what you are reading now. So for example, if uh, the two letter writers have started a long and elaborate joke, like in Chinese we call this fan chuan, and you just happen to read uh, one of the letters in the middle, you might think that they believe in something that they are actually against. So that's just one way that reading someone else's letter could be misinterpretation. And why is this idea of misinterpretation so important? Uh, because remember in this era, the idea of uh, society is extremely important. Socializing the social realm. And so there must be a clear distinction between what goes on in society and what goes on at home. The same way that you are not the same person uh, in front of your parents and in front of your friends. Um, when these people are out in society, they present a different side of themselves than when they interact with close friends and family. Uh, and so the boundary of home or, or privacy, the boundary between privacy and society, the private realm and the social realm is not just a spatial boundary. It's not just like the door of your front house or the front door of your house. It's also uh, it also includes letters, right? Letters, even though they pass through society, are actually part of the private realm. It's just like if you're having a conversation with a close friend. Uh, so reading someone else's letter without permission is like eavesdropping, listening in to two people having an intimate conversation in their bedroom. It's uh, the same kind of invasion of privacy. And so it's a violation of the laws of honor. Because of this, uh, Anne remembers that one ought to be, uh, no one ought to be judged or to be known by such testimony, such evidence. And yet uh, she does learn this evidence through reading someone else's letter without the writer's permission. But of course here she's not gaining completely new information. She's merely getting confirmation of what Mrs. Smith has been telling her. So on the one hand, yeah, she shouldn't have been reading the letter, but on the other hand, it's very unlikely that she is misinterpreting this letter. OK, so that's question two. You know, now that I think about it, um, the movie Love and Friendship, it says that it's based on the in uh, the I think it was incomplete, right? The incomplete uh, Jane Austen novella Lady Susan. But I do believe that the screenwriter also included elements from other works by Jane Austen. So, you know, that that point of the story where uh, the dude reads uh, Lady Susan's letter, I think may have been taken directly from Persuasion. Uh, this this scene that we're talking about right now. OK, next question. Anne thinks of herself and Captain Wentworth that if there be constant attachment on each side, our hearts must understand each other ere long. 
We are not boy and girl to be captiously irritable, misled by every moment's inadvertence and wantonly playing with our own happiness. So first of all, what in the world does this mean? Uh, let's translate this. So if let, OK, let's actually jump to to the page 147. There we go. OK, starting here. If there be constant attachment, so first of all, be. Today we would say if there is. Um, this is a dying part of English grammar, so grammar as a part of language also evolves. And this particular part of English is slowly dying out. And this is the subjunctive, 假设语气. Today, when we talk about the subjunctive, we're not actually talking about the subjunctive. We're talking about conditionals, 条件假设. The act, so when, like, for example, uh, if, like, if someone does something, then someone else will do something else, right? That's a uh, conditional, if, then. The actual, a meaning of subjunctive is not certain. So this statement is not this is not describing or not saying something that actually happens, will happen or has happened. It's purely in the realm of the speculative or the hypothetical. Maybe it may happen if it happens. That's when you're supposed to use the subjunctive. Now, what is the how does the subjunctive look in English? You use the uh, uh, if the, you use what's called the infinitive verb in Chinese, that's um, Now, most of the time, the infinitive verb in English is the same as the present tense. And that's why it's uh, the subjunctive is slowly dying out because people just use the present tense. But sometimes um, it's more obvious that there is a difference. So for example, here, the, the main verb is be, if there be constant attachment. Today we would say if there were or if there is but the true subjunctive is to use the infinitive ranging, which is to be. So by if you, when you see this use of the word be, you know that this is a subjunctive, that it's not actually happening, it's not being predicted, it's being considered. It's a hypothetical. What if this happens? Um, so here, surely if there be constant attachment on each side, which means if both people still like each other, our hearts must understand each other ear long. Ear means before, before long. So the idea Anne is thinking here is, uh, if we both still like each other, then over time we must, uh, this, this truth that we both like each other, must come out, must be revealed. It uh, it won't stay hidden forever. We are not boy and girl to be captiously irritable. So irritable, of course, means annoyed or easily provoked. Captiously here, uh, you notice that it looks like the word capture. It means to to be controlled by this emotion captiously irritable, unavoidably irritable, uncontrollably irritable. Misled by every moment's inadvertence. OK, so the word inadvertence means something very differently from uh, today. When we say the word inadvertently, we mean uh, like by accident, not intentional. But inadvertence, if you go back to the original meaning of the word uh, advert, advert means to uh, to redirect attention, to, to, to change direction. So 
to inadvertence means something that is a distraction that has drawn your attention away from what is important, a diversion, a detour. Um, and then and wantonly, which means willfully, which means like zi'ida, right? Without purpose, simply because you want to, or even just without reason, playing with our own happiness. So if we translate this entire sentence, it means uh, if we if we still do like each other, both of us, then this truth must uh, be found out over time. We are not, uh, you know, a little boy and little girl still easily provoked by our emotions, uh, still easily distracted by every moment's uh, change or whimsy or or you know distraction uh, and playing with our happiness for no good reason we are not that so that's what this sentence means the question is do you agree why or why not you know I we can take this in two parts, right? The first idea is our feelings for each other must come out sooner or later. This part, yeah, I kind of agree. If Anne and Wentworth keep interacting with each other, if they keep uh, if they keep on staying part of each other's lives, then yeah, I think sooner or later they will realize that the other person also still cares about them. So um, yeah, I think that makes sense. When when two people interact with each other over time through like hints and details and suggestions, you start to truly understand what they think and what they feel. So yeah, as long as they stay in each other's lives, they will one day realize that they the other person also still likes them. But what about the second part? We are no longer little kids captive to our emotions, playing with our happiness for no good reason. I mean, I think that's what they're trying to do. I think that's their ideal. But if we look at their actual behavior in the novel, I don't know, it seems kind of silly to me, right? Every time they they talk, uh, they have to very carefully avoid talking about their past history together. Uh, or like when Wentworth plucks the young child Walter off of Anne and both of them get immediately embarrassed. This to me seems like they are easily distracted and provoked, uh, provoked by their emotions. This is exactly what Anne says that they are not. Um, I think Anne slowly learns how to avoid this kind of reaction. Remember when uh, she is talking to Lady Russell about what happened at Lyme, and she has to mention Captain Wentworth. Every time she mentions Wentworth, Anne gets embarrassed. But she learns how to deal with that, right? She, she uh, talks about Wentworth as related to Louisa, the fact that they are apparently a couple. And by talking about Wentworth in that way, Anne is able to avoid feeling embarrassed. So she is gradually learning how to deal with these immature emotions. Um, and that also kind of tells us that. Remember when she said that she was older emotionally than Captain Benwick? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. We're not sure about that. Um, she has experienced more complex emotions than Benwick. Um, but if you look at it from this point of view, that does not necessarily mean that she is more mature or older. Um, in fact, let's keep reading. So she has just told herself, we're not young kids. I have to control my emotions. And yet a few minutes afterwards, she felt as if 
they're being in company with each other. So there means Anne and Wentworth. And they're being in company with each other under their present circumstances. Could only be exposing them to inadvertencies and misconstructions of the most mischievous kind. Misconstruction means misinterpretation uh, or misunderstanding. In Chinese, we would call this Ujie. Mischievous. Today, we this just means like uh, naughty, you know, like rebellious. But mischief, the noun ending in F, used to mean uh, something more serious. It's not just something annoying, but like something harmful or even evil. So mischievous means uh, something that could cause harm. So here she she has just said, I need to stop being a baby and deal with my emotions uh, like an adult. And then she says, you know, maybe I should separate myself from him in case I get distracted again and uh, there arises some misunderstandings that could cause harm to both of us. In other words, she still doesn't believe that she can control her emotions very well. But also the idea of misunderstanding, I guess it, this also means she doesn't think that Wentworth can control his emotions very well either. And, you know, looking at his behavior, looking at the evidence that we have, I agree. Uh, Wentworth is also quite often embarrassed whenever he thinks of uh, his history with Anne. OK. Uh, up to this point, do you want to ask questions? Do you have some questions to ask me? No, OK, let's continue. Question four. In the end, Anne believes that she was right to refuse Captain Wentworth the first time. Do you agree why or why not? Let's take a look at this, 164. Here. Uh, I believe here she is talking to, I believe this is Benwick. Is it Benwick? She's. Uh, she's talking to some guy. Uh, let's see. Harville, she's talking with Captain Harville, not Benwick, Harville, uh, at the party. And this is um, being overheard by Wentworth. Because, and it's important that he overhears this because she's talking about the past. I've been thinking over the past. I am trying impartially to judge of the right and wrong. I mean, with regard to myself. And I must believe that I was right, much as I suffered from it, that I was perfectly right in being guided by the friend whom you will love better than you do now. So this, of course, is Lady Russell. She thinks she was right to listen to Lady Russell. To me, she was in the place of a parent. So she was like my parent because, of course, her mother was dead. Do not mistake me, however. I am not saying that she did not err in her advice. So I am not saying that she did not err. Two negatives makes a positive. Uh, so she did err or make a mistake in giving that advice. So Anne is saying she was right to listen to Lady Russell, even though Lady Russell's advice was bad. Continuing, it was perhaps one of those cases in which advice is good or bad only as the event decides, which means uh, you can only tell whether this is good advice depending on what happens afterwards. <clears throat> 
as the event decides in English today, we would say in the event, which means depending on the consequences, depending on what actually happens. So in other words, Anne at first says uh, Lady Russell maybe did not give good advice, but then she says, you know what? Maybe it's not like the advice itself is good or bad. Maybe it only depends on how things turn out. Uh, so in other words, because Captain Wentworth is now rich and has returned to Anne's life, therefore Lady Russell's advice was bad. But if Captain Wentworth did not become rich, or you know he died at sea, then it would have been good advice uh, for Anne to break off with him. Continuing, and for myself, I certainly never should in any circumstance of tolerable similarity give such advice. So in any circumstance of tolerable similarity, which means in any similar situation, I personally would not give this advice. So it, she's saying if I were Lady Russell, I would not ask Anne to break off with Captain Wentworth. So here she's saying it turns out Lady Russell's advice was bad. I myself would never give that advice, but I mean that I was right in submitting to her, in following her, obeying her, and that if I had done otherwise, I should have suffered more in continuing the engagement than I did even in giving it up because I should have suffered in my conscience. Ooh, OK. So Anne here is saying, uh, if I had not followed Lady Russell's advice and things did turn out good, like they actually did, and I did get married to a rich sailor named Wentworth, I would still suffer, Anne says, in my conscience. Uh, because she disobeyed someone that she considers to be a parent. Continuing, I have now, as far as such a sentiment is allowable in human nature, nothing to reproach myself with. Reproach means blame. Uh, and if I mistake not, a strong sense of duty is no bad part of a woman's portion. Portion here means like good character or duty. Something that uh, a woman ought to do. So here she's saying, uh, but because I did follow Lady Russell's advice, I, there's nothing I think I should be blamed for because a strong sense of duty following and obeying one's parents is a good thing in a woman. Now we do know that um, Anne is not always um, only playing the role of a woman, right? She often makes decisions outside of the home as well. But even though this, this is the case, uh, in terms of being polite, she still has to um, present herself as a good woman. So today when we read a sentence like this, uh, many of us might think, why just a woman's portion? Why not a man's portion? Shouldn't a man also follow his parents? But the point here isn't the difference between men and women. The point here is that Anne is a woman and she feels the need to play the role of a woman in society. That's why she says a woman's portion. It's not a comparison. Um, so Returning to the question, she says she was right to refuse Captain Wentworth the first time, not because that was the right thing to do, but because it was right to obey one's parent or parent figure. In other words, Lady Russell. Do you agree? Why or why not? I think Anne's logic is very good here. Right, she ta she talks about both sides of the question. The first side is, should I obey or should I disobey? And she tells us that one should try at their best to obey their parents, which you know generally is good advice. Generally, the second half of the question is, uh, is it the best 
choice or best advice? And Anne says that depends on how things actually turned out. So of course, now that we know that Wentworth is rich, uh, we think that Lady Russell gave bad advice, but at the time Captain Wentworth was poor, had no achievements and could have died in, on the sea. So. Uh, at the time, I believe Lady Russell's advice was good advice. Um, but like if we take a step back and look at this kind of situation. Uh, Anne herself says she would never have given this advice, and I think that is very wise because it is in fact the kind of situation where. Uh, whether the advice is good or not really does depend on what happens. So in other words, it's impossible to make sure that you give good advice in this situation. Uh, therefore, the best thing to do, to do is to not, not give advice. Uh, but since Lady Russell did give her advice, um, Anne can't say uh, that her advice is bad at the moment, right? She can only say that now, but at the moment of decision, Anne can't say it's bad advice, she can't say it's good advice, so there's no reason to disobey uh, Lady Russell. So you know, I think Anne is Anne is thinking very clearly here. Yeah, she was right to refuse Captain Wentworth the first time. Now the thing about conscience. When Anne says conscience, I think she's just being polite, uh, because we know that marriage is not just between two people; it's also between two families. And so if Anne marries Wentworth and becomes Mrs. Wentworth, her relationship with her own family, the Elliots, would probably not be very good. I mean, right now it's not very good either, but it's not bad. It's just like they ignore her. Uh, but if she did disobey Lady Russell, Lady Russell, her it, that might damage that might have damaged her relationship with Lady Russell. And that is a very important relationship. So because she had no reason to disobey and she had very many good reasons to obey, uh, I think Anne is right. You know, she was right to to break off her engagement with Wentworth the first time. Uh, what do you guys think? Do you have other ideas? My thinking is like if she's like want to like keep a really good relationship with like um, Miss, Mr. Russell. I mean, she do can be still be from with the uh, other people, but um, the way is like how she just like um, communicate with them. Right. So you're saying that it's not just a simple question of to obey or disobey. She yeah. could have tried to. I'm pretty sure that Anne tried to have this conversation. I'm pretty sure. Um, but you, we, if you look at the facts of the situation, uh, as Anne herself says, she at the moment at that time could not tell whether it was good or bad advice. You can only tell that after the fact. So yeah. if she has that conversation with Lady Russell, what can she say? Like, I love him. Hmm. But in that case, it's not a marriage, it's elopement. Oh, OK. Right? Oh, yeah, so, because in that area, um, this is kind of in that time, it's not very good. Yeah, if you elope, that means so again, marriage is between two families. So if you ever need help or like financial support, you can ask both families for help. And we see this right in the Musgrove yeah. family. Um, but if you elope, that basically means that uh, you can't depend on help from uh, the side of the family that you run away from. Mm. And uh, because Wentworth, we don't really know Wentworth's family very well, right? So yeah. in this novel, to elope for Anne would have mean would have meant just living with Wentworth, just the two of them, no support. And remember, Wentworth Wentworth was poor. Mm. 
and Anne is a woman, so it would have been a very hard marriage. Mm. Um, yeah. OK, thank you, thank you for your comment. OK, let's continue. The final question about this novel, and therefore the final question that is related to the final exam. Question five. Do you think everyone gets their just desserts at the end? Why or why not? How would you describe the morality of the ending? So just desserts means they get what they deserve. Do you think that is true? Uh, so let's think about this. Uh, who has? Uh, whose lives have changed by the end of the story? Anne and, and Wentworth, of course. Um, and I'm sure we can all agree that that is that their marriage is exactly what they deserved. Uh, although we should still remember that it's not entirely a perfect ending, right? Because as the last page says, she gloried in being a sailor's wife, but she must pay the tax of quick alarm. Uh, alarm here is not like your 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 phone alarm. Alarm here means uh, a sudden change, a sudden preparation for emergency. Uh, what quick alarm for belonging to that profession, which is if possible, more distinguished in its domestic virtues than in its national importance for being married to a sailor. Right, uh, Wentworth is still a captain. He still has to serve his country, and if there's another war, well, uh, when did this war end? 1817, 1815, 1830? I can't remember. So the war that they're currently fighting is the war with France, right? What is the war with France? Do you guys know? It's the Napoleonic Wars. It's the war with Napoleon, 1815. OK, so the war end, uh, is basically about to end. But like if there's a new war later, and Wentworth has to go fight again. Um, I was about to say Jane, not Jane. Anne uh, can't change that. She would still have to like stay at home and hope that her husband lives. Um, so it's not a perfect ideal marriage. Um, right, the dread of a future war. This is the only thing that could dim her sunshine, dim her happiness. Um, does Anne deserve that? Um, I, I really don't think so, right? She is, by the end of the book, the best person in the book. I'm sure we can all agree. She is kind and compassionate and wise and has experienced so much of life and helpful and obedient, just like everything. She's like the perfect woman or just person in the book. Uh, so if she really did get what she deserves, she would not have to deal with the fact that her husband might die in the future war. Um, Wentworth, yeah, yeah, that's a good ending for him. Who else? Do, who else's lives have changed? Mr. Elliot and Mrs. Clay end up running away together, but they don't marry. Uh, let's see if I can let's see if I can find this. Uh, fine. This is going to take forever. Hang on. Um, there we go. So after uh, Anne gets engaged, Mr. Elliot basically lost his head. Like he got really angry. Uh, but he could still do something for his own interest. This is page 166. He could still do something for his own interest and his own enjoyment. He soon quitted Bath, so he left Bath. 
and on Mrs. Clay's quitting it likewise soon afterwards, and being next heard of as established under his protection in London. So she didn't get married to him. She's under his protection. Which I think is just a very polite way of saying that like he owns her now or something. Um, like she is now his woman, even though they're not married. Um, so Mrs. Clay, it does seem like Mrs. Clay was trying to marry Sir Walter, even though Sir Walter uh, never expressed any interest in her. So uh, what we have suspected about Mrs. Clay is pretty much true. And also what Mrs. Smith has said about Mr. Elliot is also pretty much true. So these are like the two worst people in the book and their fate is to be revealed and to be. Uh, like ejected from that social circle to be separated from that social circle and uh, for Mrs. Clay to now lose some of her freedom to Mr. Elliot. And we know that Mr. Elliot is not a good person to have as your master. So I think um, Mrs. Clay, yeah, gets what she deserves, but I think Mr. Elliot could have gotten it worse off. Uh, well, it depends, right? Because here the novel says maybe she uh, might worm her way into becoming the next wife of Sir William, the wife of the next Sir William. So the idea is um, maybe Mrs. Clay might try to to get Mr. Elliot to marry her because uh, Mr. Elliot supposedly would still inherit the title of uh, Sir, the, the baronetcy that Sir Walter has. But of course, his name is not Walter. His name is William. William. Elliot, so he would be called Sir William. Um, yeah, no, Mr. Elliot gets off way too easily. He deserves more punishment. Who else do we have whose lives have been changed? Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm forgetting somebody. Can you remind me who else's lives are changed? Benwick and Louisa marry each other. I think that's a good match. Uh, like Benwick is, I mean, Wentworth says that Benwick deserves better, but Anne thinks that they're a good match. Like Louisa can bring some more cheer and energy, and then Benwick has more like learning and culture. Yeah, it's a good match. And also the Harvilles are a good family. The Musgroves are a good family. They are of the same social class. Neither are upper class. Uh, they are upper middle class, so that's also a good point. Who else? Who else has their lives changed? Is that it? Am I missing someone? Guys, am I forgetting someone? And probably not. OK, um, let's take a short break. When we come back, I will introduce you to uh, next week's uh, material and then the rest of the time we will talk about uh, starting from chapter 21. OK, break. OK, let's take a look at chapter 21. Um, so here Anne is looking forward to visiting Mrs. Smith again, uh, not only because she likes visiting her, but also because it means avoiding Mr. Elliot. Uh, 
she kind of senses that Mr. Elliot uh, wants to marry her. She doesn't want to marry him, so she's avoiding him. Um, I should first mention that um, now that we have finished the novel, you will notice that um, from the very beginning when we were thinking, oh, Anne probably ends up with Captain Wentworth, we were right. Um, but the last four chapters have to deal with um, after Mr. Elliot is is revealed to be an evil person and only has one choice left, right? Which is Captain Wentworth. So the question then becomes, how do they marry? And here's here's the thing, like in a in such a social atmosphere, Anne can't just go visit Captain Wentworth for no reason, right? We've talked about how everything that Anne does has to have a reason for doing it, um, and she has no reason to visit Captain Wentworth. So the question then becomes, how do they tell the other person that they still like them when they can only meet in public? How do they have a private conversation in public? And the answer that Jane Austen finds is to have Anne talk about her feelings uh, regarding love to Harville while Wentworth overhears. So that way Wentworth learns that Anne still likes him. And so the final question is, how does he tell Anne that he likes her? And the way that the novel solves this is uh, he, he secretly writes a letter underneath the letter that he's supposed to write and then finds an excuse to stuff it into Anne's hands as he's about to leave. So again, it's a very small moment of privacy within a public situation. Uh, they have to actively steal time from their public uh, engagements in order to tell each other that they still love each other. Um, so that's also a limitation of a society that is so focused on the public. And it's something that we today don't have to worry about because we all have cell phones and cell phones are basically our own little private realm that we carry with us wherever we go. Uh, so that's the main conflict of the last part of the novel. Uh, OK, continuing. Um, so she wanted to avoid Mr. Elliot, but at this moment she doesn't know that he's a terrible guy, so she feels a great deal of goodwill toward him. Uh, she owed him gratitude and regard, maybe even compassion. Uh, and the main reason is because he seemed to have uh, the right which he seemed to have to interest her by everything in situation, by his own sentiments. In other words, because he is the next heir of Sir Walter, and because he seems like the perfect gentleman, Anne really has no good reason to refuse him, and yet she is not accepting him. And so because uh, Anne is such a kind person, she thinks that um, Mr. Elliot must feel very annoyed that she is not accepting him, and there's no good reason for that. So she feels compassion and gratitude for him that he does not grow angry with her. He does not try to force her to answer his proposal. And that's why she feels gratitude uh, and respect. Um, she can't really bring up the real reason, which is she still likes Captain Wentworth because like they're not engaged. That's not a real reason. You, you can marry someone while liking someone else. That's two different questions. Um, here she says her affection would be Wentworth's forever. And that's the real reason she can't marry Mr. Elliot. Uh, OK, she visits Mr. S uh, Mrs. Smith. She talks about the concert uh, in the previous chapter where Mr. Elliot basically lets Anne know that he wants to marry her. Um, and they have a conversation about this. Uh, boring conversation. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, Mrs. Smith says, 
You need not tell me that you had a pleasant evening at the concert. I see it in your eye. I perfectly see how the hours passed that you had always something agreeable to listen to. In the intervals of the converse of the concert, it was conversation. Anne half smiled and said, do you see that in my eye? Uh, and Mrs. Smith says, yes, I do. Your countenance, which means face, your expression. Perfectly informs me that you were in company last night with the person whom you think the most agreeable in the world, the person who interests you at this present time more than all the rest of the world put together. Now. She is correct. But. They're thinking of different people. Anne is thinking of Wentworth, but Mrs Smith is thinking of Mr Elliot. And here we see the difference 129. Pray said Mrs Smith, which means please tell me. Is Mr Elliot aware of your acquaintance with me? Does he know that I am in Bath? And it is only here that Anne realizes the mistake she had been under. Uh, and this is a pretty big mistake because if Mrs Smith, who never leaves her house except for to take a bath, also thinks that Anne is in love with Mr Elliot, that must mean that everyone thinks that Anne loves Mr Elliot, or at least that they will be married. And as Anne was just thinking to herself, why not? He is the next heir. Uh, he is upper class. He's the perfect gentleman. Why wouldn't anyone think that they would marry? Except Anne doesn't want to marry him. That's the only uh, that's the only point of resistance. Uh, so Anne suddenly realizes here that everyone must think that they will marry. It's the same situation as between Captain Wentworth and Louisa. And because Anne doesn't actually want to marry Mr. Elliot, uh, she decides that she has to distance herself from him to avoid uh, misconstruction, right? Misunderstanding. But she can't argue the point here because that's not what they're talking about, right? Suddenly, Mrs. Smith is asking, does Mr. Elliot know me? Sorry, does Mr. Elliot know that you know me? Does he know that I am in Bath? It's a different subject. So Anne cannot really say, oh, I'm not interested in Mr. Elliot. That was the last subject of conversation. So uh, she can't say that. She has to reply to what Mrs. Smith is saying. And so Anne says, are you acquainted with Mr. Elliot? Do you know him? Um, and then the, the, we slowly get the conversation about what a terrible person Mr. Elliot is. Um, but Mrs. Smith, we later, like later she explains, actually, let's see if we can find this. Later she explains that here, um, the normal course of the conversation would be, uh, tell me what you like about Mr. Elliot, right? The conversation is about Anne and Mr. Elliot. But that's not what Mrs. Smith wants to do. She wants to find out if, if it is safe for her to tell Anne about what kind of person Mr. Elliot actually is. Um, because if Anne really does love Mr. Elliot, then Mrs. Smith decided that she would not tell Anne. Uh, because, you know, they're in love. What use would it be? Or it's, it's a terrible thing to say something bad about someone that your friend loves. But if it turns out that Anne does not love Mr. Elliot, then Mrs. Smith would tell Anne the truth. That's why she starts out this this part of the conversation by asking, does he know that I am here? Does he know that you know me? Uh, so at first Anne says, oh, you know, I, I, I think he's OK. I just don't like him. And Mrs. Smith says, uh, don't worry about it. Marry him. It's a, it, if that's your only objection, 
uh, then that's not an objection at all. He's still a good person. But uh, she says that it is not Mr. Elliot that she was thinking about when they were talking about how much a uh, good time Anne had at the concert. So now that Mrs. Smith knows that Anne is not in love with Mr. Elliot, um, she thinks it's safe to tell Anne the truth about Mr. Elliot. Right here we go. I beg your pardon. This is Mrs. Smith. I beg your pardon for the short answers I have been giving you. This is page 132. 132. Uh, the short answers I have been giving you, but I have been uncertain what I ought to do. I have been doubting and considering as to what I ought to tell you. There were many things to be taken into account, so I had to consider many things before deciding what to tell you. One hates to be officious, to be giving bad impressions, making mischief. To be officious means like to be giving advice without being asked for advice. Mischief, as we said, was harm. So to make mischief at that time means to cause harm. Even the smooth surface of family union seems worth preserving, though there may be nothing durable under beneath. So here Mrs. Smith is saying simply because Mr. Elliot is your cousin, I think that is worth preserving. That is a good reason not to tell you something bad about him. However, I have determined, which means I have decided. I think I'm right. This means that she hasn't actually decided only now when she says, I think I am right. Has she actually decided? 132. I think you ought to be made acquainted with Mr. Elliot's real character. Though I fully believe that at present you have not the smallest intention of accepting him, of marrying him, there is no saying what may happen in the future. You might sometime or other be differently affected toward him, which means you may feel differently toward him later. Hear the truth. Therefore, now, while you are still unprejudiced. Prejudice used to mean either good or bad. Today, prejudice means bad, but at the time, prejudice just means preconception, something, an idea that you have before you truly know the truth. Could be good, could be bad. Uh, so here, Mrs. Smith is saying, while you still don't feel good toward Mr. Elliot, I must tell you the truth, because if later you do feel positive toward Mr. Elliot, maybe when I tell you the truth, you will not want to listen. So I must tell you now. And this is one of the most exciting sentences in the novel. Mr. Elliot is a man without heart or conscience. Bum, bum, bum. A designing which means crafty, which means like he always is manipulating people. Wary, which means careful, cold blooded being who thinks only of himself. Who for his own interest or ease would be guilty of any cruelty or any treachery, which means like betrayal. Beipan. That could be perpetrated, which means to be done. To be carried out without risk of his general character. So he's willing to do anything evil as long as nobody knows. He has no feeling for others. Wow, so when Anne said, you know, he seems too careful, maybe he's hiding something. We had no idea that he was hiding this level of evil. And when we consider that Mr. Elliot has already proposed to Anne, or at least has let Anne know that he wants to marry her. Like, wow, so lucky that Anne learned the truth before she accepted his proposal. My God, can you imagine what might have happened if she had gotten married to him? <laughs> 
this is the kind of intense feeling that these few sentences uh, give to the reader. But it's not too sudden, right? It's still believable because of the way that this conversation is designed. First, Anne realizes that people think she loves Mr. Elliot, which is not the truth. So when she decides that she has to be careful about this, this is already creating some distance between Anne and Mr. Elliot in the mind of the reader. We know that in the future, Anne would plan to separate herself from him. So the likelihood that they would marry is now decreasing. It's less and less likely. Secondly, in the middle of this conversation, Mrs. Smith says, does he know that you know me? Does he know that I am here? Now, if Mr. Elliot were a good man, first of all, Mrs. Smith would not wait so late to ask this. But secondly, she would not ask. She would say, tell him that I am here. If he's a good man, there is no reason why Mrs. Smith should not let him know that she is also here. Therefore, the way that she asks this, does he know that I'm here? Does he know that you know me? Means that she's being careful, defensive. She's trying to protect herself from Mr. Elliot. So by that point in the conversation, we already have a feeling that maybe Mr. Elliot is not such a good person, that maybe Anne is right, that he is hiding something. But we would never expect that he is hiding this level of evil. My God. Um, and so that's when like the novel really shifts into high gear, when things really moving, start moving quickly, um, things become more emotionally important. There are stakes involved. There's something that is at risk. And that is when the novel really becomes sensational, full of sensation and feeling and emotion. And that idea of sensation and feeling might uh, occur appear on the final exam. Just to warn you. OK, that's it today. Um, do you have questions? No, no questions. OK, see you next week and we'll talk about the poetry. OK, so as we talked about before, the final exam will only be about persuasion. Uh, and it's it's the same as the midterm exam. Two questions, choose one. Remember to give evidence. We talked about this in class before going to remote learning. Um, and after the discussion next week, I will preview the exam questions with you. But next week, uh, we're going to read some First World War poetry for fun, even though like war poetry includes people dying a lot. And it's actually kind of uh, painful and sad poetry, but it's it's good poetry. It's powerful poetry. So we're going to read a few of those. The poems are here on Moodle, and then the discussion questions are also here. If you want to look at the questions first, here's what the the file looks like. Um, this is all completely like you can you can copy and paste this. Um, it begins with a brief introduction to First World War poetry. Uh, we're not reading Rupert Brooke. We're reading Siegfried Sassoon. So here's an introduction of his life. We're not reading they. We're reading, um, I mean, if you want to read, can you read they? Yeah, if you want to read they, you can if you want. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty good poem. Um, we're reading The Rear Guard. Uh, the General. And Glory of Women. We're reading these three. And if you want, you can also read everyone saying the full poem is also here for you.
Uh, and after Siegfried Sassoon, the next poet we're reading is Wilfred Owen. And here's an introduction of his life uh, in case you're interested. Actually, no, I should talk to you about their lives. Um, so Siegfried Sassoon uh, was from an upper class family. Actually, I'll hang on. I'll talk about that later. Um, and for Wilfred Owen, we are reading this one, Dolch. I think it's Dolce et Decorum Est, which is Latin. The footnote explains what this means at the bottom. And we're also reading Futility. Yeah, so we're reading these two by Wilfred Owen and then the previous three by Siegfried Sassoon. OK, so let's talk about this war thing, World War One. So before the First World War, the general idea of war is that it is glorious and that your own country should always win. War was seen as something to unite the country against a common enemy. So like the tradition of opposing a war, uh, even though World War One is terrible or was terrible, but the tradition of opposing a war only really began in the 1950s and 1960s with the Vietnam War. Before that, uh, for a society about to go to war, it was seen as morally good and just and right to support your own country in that war. Um, and so it became like a tenet of patriotism. If you oppose the war, you are not patriotic. Um, now, of course, we know that today we know that's silly. It depends on why your country is going to war. And also some people believe that any war is a bad war, and you know that's also a valid belief. But at the time it was this very homogeneous atmosphere of you have to support your country in the war. It was seen as cowardly, immoral, uh, and even like perverse to not support your country, not just oppose your country, but to not support your country when it's about to go to war. Uh, and part of this is because the media environment, like the newspapers, were all very much uh, pro-war all the time uh, because war sells newspapers, right? If uh, does that, you know, we all know that disasters and like wars and things like that make for big news. And when there's lots of news, people buy lots of newspapers. So that's one reason, but also because in the second half of the 19th century, I should say from the beginning of newspapers, there was really no such thing as an objective neutral press. Newspapers began because people wanted wanted to know what was going on and they started to include uh, opinions by like famous people or editors or politicians uh, as a way of like spreading the ideas of these people. So and then people of course would buy newspapers to read the ideas of people that they agree with and so from the very beginning, there was never any idea that uh, the opinions and even sometimes the reporting that you get are neutral. They are always in favor of a certain kind of perspective or value. Uh, and this kind of journalism after it it became, uh, you know, after we started having more neutral journalism, this kind of journalism was called yellow journalism. And yellow journalism got so bad that um, today what we call fake news used to be most of the big news stories. Like, for example, uh, you know how like when in when we study Chinese history, we learn that uh, the Second World War or the Chinese war against Japan started in 1937 uh, because like Japan kept on making up reasons or making up excuses for things that happened and for why Japan has to attack China, things like that. How is that possible? 
because at the time newspapers always supported their country or most newspapers always supported their country, the mainstream newspapers. Uh, and sometimes these newspapers would simply like invent things to say. Um, and that's how that's why uh, it was so easy to start a war back then, because like as long as you can get a, a few big newspapers to say something happened, it could serve as an excuse for your country to start a war. Or another famous example is during one US presidential election. Um, can't remember which one. I think it was an early election, like in the late 18th century. I think it was uh, John Adams versus Thomas Jefferson. So the second president versus uh, John John Adams won, but later Thomas Jefferson would also become president. Um, but anyways, during that presidential campaign, uh, the John Adams people, uh, the 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 newspapers that supported John Adams said that Thomas Jefferson was a French spy. And the newspapers that supported Thomas Jefferson said that John Adams was dead. Just like dead. Uh, so yeah, what I'm saying is at the time newspapers were not neutral. They were always biased and the mainstream newspapers were always biased in favor of the government. So the entire atmosphere was one where you had to support your country going to war. And uh, the reason another reason why war was seen as something something good and glorious and noble is because of literature all the way back to the homeric epics right the iliad and the odyssey war was seen as somewhere where you can gain glory and fame and become a hero forever um and you know for a lot of history that is true when war was one like you're on the battlefield and you have like a sword and you're fighting against someone else who has a sword. Yeah, it's true that war is a contest of strength and skill, right? Whoever is the better fighter would win the fight. Um, but this slowly started to change with the invention of things like guns. And, uh, you know, even when when we had when we used arrows, right? Bows and arrows. There was still skill involved. Uh, you had to the, the commander had to have a good sense of where to put the archers, where the archers should shoot, when they should shoot, um, how to use archers in your army. So there's still skill involved and also it takes physical strength to actually shoot an arrow. Have you ever tried to pull a war bow? Like an, not like a toy, but like one of the actual bows that people used to have. I have tried. It's really hard. Um, and I'm not just I'm not even talking about like the Olympic bows that we have today for like sports competitions. I mean actual bows that people actually use to fight wars. Those things are really hard to pull. It takes a lot of strength. Um, so yeah, that is still connected with the idea of like honor and glory and noble wars. But then we started to have things like guns. Now the first guns were not really powerful. Um, like for example, in the American Revolution, the main kind of gun that they used is called a musket. Uh, oh, okay, Joseph Mao Zedong. So a musket, uh, here's what here's how you use a musket. You have the gun itself. It's like a long rifle kind of gun. And you have to put what's known as the shot or what we today we call it a bullet, but it's not really a bullet. It's just like iron filings, like pieces of iron. You take that, you have to stick it into the front of the gun. Uh, and then you have to take an iron rod or an iron stick and you have to push the, the shot into the back of the gun. Then you have to take a, a, a pouch of gunpowder that you have prepared beforehand and you take the gunpowder and you have to carefully pour it into the front of the gun. And then you take the rod again and then you stuff the rest of the powder into the back of the gun. 
I may have mixed this up. I think you have to pour the gunpowder first. First gunpowder and then the iron shot and then the rod and you stick it all into the back of the gun. Uh, and then finally you, you're ready to to fire the gun. But here's the thing. Because like uh, it's just like some iron in the tube. When you push the iron out, it doesn't go very far. So like when you look at um, portrayals of like the American Revolution, you have two armies that are in in a line, right? They each form a line and they have to slowly maneuver so that the two lines are facing each other. And then you have to wait for your commander's order to fire. So it's two lines of people standing up facing each other, aiming their guns, their muskets at each other. Um, waiting for their commander to yell fire. Why? Because the guns were really weak. And they didn't go very far. So what the commanders were doing was they were trying to balance two things. On the one hand, you have to get close enough to the enemy for your guns to actually hurt them. On the other hand, you don't want to get too close uh, because then the, the enemy might fire first. So you have to fire before the enemy, but after your guns are in range of the enemy. And so that's basically the most important calculation uh, for early war for wars that in the early period of guns. And then usually once the armies get run out of uh, gunpowder or ammo or they get too close, uh, then the commander will say arm bayonets. Um, Bayonets is of course like a right? The the blade that you, the knife that you add to the front of the gun, and so basically uh, this kind of warfare is also very similar to to sword warfare, except now your sword is also a gun. Uh, so there's still the idea of skill and and glory, things like that, but by the time we get to the Second World War, something very important has been invented, the rifle. Today in Chinese we call this changchang. But really the word rifle refers to the fact that in the barrel of the gun, the, the main tube of the gun, it's not just a smooth iron tube. There is a spiral in the tube or more than one spiral. And what this the carved into the tube and what this does is it makes the bullet start to spin. And when the bullet spins, it can cut through air. And when it can cut through air, it can travel farther without losing speed. In other words, this is the kind of gun that can fire over a long distance. And by long, I mean like not just in front of you. So this is a big improvement on the musket. And by the time we get to World War I, all guns have these spirals called rifling. That's why these early guns are called rifles. The spirals are called the rifling. Um, and so not only do guns have rifling, you also have automatic guns, right? In the past, if you wanted to fire a gun more than once for muskets, you had to reload every time and you also had to pull back the hammer at the back of the gun to make it hit the bullet every time. Uh, after that, someone invented the semi-automatic gun where uh, it, when you pull the trigger, the hammer hits the bullet uh, and it uses that force to bounce back so that each time you pull the trigger, the gun prepares for the next time you pull the trigger. But the fully automatic gun, uh, you don't even have to release the trigger. You keep on holding the trigger and the gun will keep firing. This is a completely new invention. And, you know, the easier it is to fire a gun, the easier it is to kill someone whether on purpose or by accident if you aim it in the wrong place. So by the time you get to World War I, war is not really about like a test of strength or a competition. It's basically like uh, how many bullets do you have and how well can you aim the gun, basically. And if it's too far away, you can't see, you can call up the artillery, Paul and they'll hit the enemy from far away. It's really no longer about a personal contest of strength. It's more about the general 
large scale strategy and using soldiers as like uh, manpower only. The soldier himself, usually it's a man. The soldier himself does not really have a lot of uh, tactics or strategy that they have to worry about. Just be in the right place at the right time and aim your gun in the right direction. That's all you have to do. But when the war started or when the war was about to start, most people didn't know this. It had been a while since the last war. Uh, and even the generals were using outdated strategies. Um, they were not, they were still thinking about, um, you know, a contest of strengths and of like defending until you have more people so that you can attack the enemy. Here's the thing. The kind of warfare where if you have more people, then you have more strength. Is a kind of warfare without like machine guns. Because you can throw as many people as you have against a machine gun and the machine gun can hold off these people for as long as it has bullets. So the idea that the more people you have, the stronger your army is, is an outdated kind of warfare. I mean, of course, if you have more people, that's better, but it depends on how you use those people, what other kind of equipment and resources you have, those questions. Uh, but the generals of the First World War were still thinking only about manpower, and that's why we have we they used trench warfare, hao gong, hao zan zan. The idea is to hold off the enemy until you have more soldiers, and then you can attack. And so to defend, you would you would basically hide in a trench, uh, dig into the ground so that the bullets can't hit you. The problem then became once you start attacking, the bullets can hit you. And because both sides had machine guns, uh, it was extremely unlikely that you would be able to make it to the other side before being hit by a machine gun. So that resulted in basically where the two sides would eat would each dig a trench and when reinforcements came, one side would try to attack the other and get completely mowed down by the machine gun of the enemy. And then when the enemy had more reinforcements, they would try to attack uh, the first group and the first group would mow down the enemy using machine guns. It was a stalemate, Jiangju. And the only thing that changed was that more and more people died. So at the beginning of World War I, when people were like, oh, it's a war, we must join and support our country, everyone was still thinking like this. It was still very patriotic and supportive of the, of the government and of the war. The, the newspapers were still portraying the enemy as like barbarians and unhuman and like evil and cruel and we must defeat them. But after the first soldiers started coming back for rest and break, uh, and after like the doctors started treating so many of wounded and people, uh, wounded soldiers, uh, the people who really knew what was going on realized that uh, the people at home were living a complete fantasy. This is not what war is like anymore. And so, uh, they they thought of different ways to try to get the truth out there. The problem is nobody wanted to believe it. In an age where newspapers are not entirely neutral, when someone says something else, you can easily say, oh, that's fake news. Nobody wanted to believe this. Uh, so, um, you know, Siegfried Sassoon, who is an upper class man, tried to um, tell people back home and also tell people higher up in the army that these generals are idiots. They have no idea what they're doing. They're wasting our lives, uh, but nobody would listen. In fact, the government actually, uh, the newspapers actually just said that he had shell shock, which today we call PTSD. Uh, something like that. Uh, so the at first this was called shell shock which means the shock of being hit by shells. Shells are the bombs, uh, the artillery. Artillery, of course, is pulp. 
Uh, so it's the shock of being being hit by so many explosions around you all day, every day. Shell shock is real. It's what we call PTSD, but and I'm sure Siegfried Sassoon suffered from shell shock, but that's not, of course, like if you suffer from from PTSD, that doesn't change your opinion about war. If you uh, if you think that war is a bad thing, having PTSD won't change your mind. Yes, that's it. That's what it is in Chinese. Pauji Shoku. Thank you. Um, like getting PTSD doesn't change your logic. It changes your experience, but it doesn't change your logic. So Siegfried, from the very beginning, his logic was not that we oh we are all suffering and we can't sleep. His logic was so many soldiers are, soldiers are dying for no reason, and that doesn't change whether he has shell shock or not. Uh, but the newspapers just said, oh, he has shell shock. Don't listen to him. So that didn't work. So he had to do uh, what people today still do, which is go directly to the public uh, to, to give them the experience of being in the war. Today, uh, people like Sassoon would write a novel. And in fact, there have been some good stories and novels about the second Iraq war in 2003. And and of course the Afghanistan war, but in that day the really powerful literature was poetry. So Siegfried Sassoon wrote poetry to give the audience, the reader, the experience of being a soldier in the First World War. So so as you can imagine, it is extremely powerful poetry and extremely horrifying poetry. Terrible things happen to soldiers in his poems. And they're short too. Like uh, in the history of literature, often when you write literature or poetry about war, it's really long poetry, right? You have to explain why the war started and like um, what goes on, what is the strategy, and then you go into detail about each battle. And then you also talk about the morality and the values. So it's usually pretty long. But Sassoon wasn't talking about any of that. He only wanted to express how terrible it was and how much sense or how much nonsense it was for so many soldiers to be dying in this war like this. So his poems were all very, sh most of them were very short. They only look at a, a, a single event or a single moment or even a single instance of irony. Uh, irony, of course, is in Chinese, we call this feng ci, but that's not exactly the same. Uh, feng ci in English would be more like sarcasm, like mockery. The idea of irony is that things are different from what they look like. So the irony of the First World War is that most people think war is honorable and glorious and noble, but the truth is it was just terrible, meaningless death. That is the irony that Sassoon wants to present. So sometimes his some of his poems are are just a simple uh, instance of that kind of irony, where most people think it's glorious, and then he gives you a scene of terrible, meaningless death. So that's Siegfried Sassoon. Wilfred Owen, um, from the beginning, was not very supportive of the war, but later he decided to join anyways. He got wounded, of course. And in hospital, he met Sassoon and they became good friends. And Owen also started writing poetry about the real facts, the real truth of the war. But um, Owen's poetry is not as ironic. There is still irony, but it's more uh, pity and sadness that these young men are dying for no good reason. Um, so that is also emotionally powerful. It doesn't make you as angry, but it does make you incredibly sad about the situation. Um, now, Siegfried Sassoon got wounded the second time and so uh, left the war before the war ended, so he survived. And he later uh, grew older, became a conservative. He wrote religious poetry and he was also gay. Wilfred Owen, after he was wounded, recovered and went back to fight, and he died in the war one month before the war ended. 
so that's just some background about the World War One poetry that I hope you will read before next week, and we will talk about these poems next week. Uh, OK, do you have questions about this? No. OK. Oh, I should also say the idea of irony, right? Um, things are not what they appear to be. It was because of the literature of the First World War. Uh, one scholar argues that it was because of the literature of the First World War that people started to distrust their government and their newspapers to, to realize that what they're reading and what they're hearing from their government may not be the truth. Because the distance, the gap between what the government was telling them about the First World War and what was actually happening was so big that the public average people simply could not dismiss it. It became something that people constantly were aware of after the war. Um, and it also created the kind of literature like if you read literature from like the late 19th century, early 20th century, like we were reading persuasion, everybody is like so serious, right? Everybody means exactly what they say. Nobody really tells a joke. Um, even when Jane Austen is kind of mocking some of the characters, it's very light. It's saying, oh, look, they're kind of silly. Uh, but after the First World War, that is when you have uh, people being sarcastic, talking about things that are completely different from what's actually happening. That's when you have people who um, no longer believe that you can actually say things like, we must support, we must be patriotic. We must support uh, our government. That's when we started having irony and sarcasm in daily life. Um, so like the First World War also had a big impact culturally as well. Um, I mean, it had a big impact in many places, right? So many young men died that um, there were too many women after the war ended, like there was an imbalance between men and women. Um, the there was a an influenza epidemic. You know, so like we have a pandemic today, right? So there has actually been a pandemic every hundred years. The last pandemic was in 1920 uh, of the Spanish flu. Uh, uh, like today when we say flu, we think, oh, it's just a bad cold, but that's because the flu virus has evolved so much that it has become weaker. When the flu first uh, arrived, it was very serious. Like people, what was it like? One fifth of the world died of the Spanish flu, something like that. Um, and that was in 1920, and that um, was worsened by the end of the war. First of all, when you have so many bodies lying around, it's very bad for hygiene. But also, after the war ended, so many soldiers had to be moved from the battlefield back home to wherever they were from, and that carried the disease with them. Uh, in many instances, so all across Europe, the war also entered Africa as well. The First World War had an African front, so also like through Africa to the North America because the United States joined the war in 1917. Uh, so and uh, because of their returning soldiers and so much death, the economy was also terrible. So like just it was, it was the First World War had a huge impact on uh, Western civilization and Western society. Um, and also like in the East, right? You guys uh, studied Chinese history. Uh, the end of the war, you had like the. Um, uh, like China signed the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, the Western powers started leaving China alone because they didn't have the power and the the labor. They didn't have the soldiers anymore. So Sun Yat-sen could and Jiang Kai-shek could start reconquering China again. Like uh, there was a huge impact. Anyway, we're getting off topic. Uh, let's go back to persuasion. <laughs> 